We're here to share with you inspiring stories that bring to life all the little and big ways that people bring more love, joy, laughter, and humanness to everyday life. Our focus is the hunt for those little moments that refuel the human soul and reminds us what life is really all about. I invite you to sit back, enjoy the moments, enjoy the stories, the adventures, and the journeys. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of What the World Needs More Of. I am here with special guest, Kayla. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Jarek. I am so excited to be here and thank you for all the listeners listening in and uh, listening to my story. I hope it can bring some, uh, some you know, love to the world, kindness, and maybe some inspiring people to do good. Well, I believe it will. I believe it definitely will. Now, for the question of the show, we'll dive right in. What do you feel the world needs more of? To me, uh, this is an easy answer and a very simple answer. I have gone through quite a bit of uh, some medical, I don't know what you call it, challenges, obstacles, struggles. And the number one thing that I think believe the world needs more of because I know I always need it and it it always helps me is really the hype man uh the hype man you when you think of a hype man you kind of think of going to a concert and the guy in the background of this thing would be like yeah yo you know but um the hype man to me is really the encouragers of the world the motivators of the world the inspirational people that drive us to do better and instead of just us wanting to always get ours and, and succeed in our life. It's kind of, um, it allows us to think about helping the world change. And, you know, without a village, you really can't, you can't succeed. And the hype man helps you succeed. They're the ones that's telling you to keep going when you're having those bad days and those, those bad moments. Um, really the team around you is what helps you be the best version of yourself. That's what I believe. And it, it allows you to do things that you truly think are impossible to succeed on. Mm, I love that. Now I've seen how you do that in the world, but in your perception, how do you bring more of that into life each day? You know, it's, that's a tough question for me because I get a lot of people who respond, you inspire me, you help me keep going. You, I wanted to quit and you've shown me that I can, I can get that second transplant, that third transplant. I can go through this procedure. Um, and really, I don't, I don't know how or why people think that. Um, I don't really think personally, like I can change the world. Like that's, Changing the world is something that's so much bigger than ourselves. Um, so for me, really, I just try to share and be authentic and be truthful about what I'm experiencing and how it affects me and how I react to it. And I think that by sharing, you know, it just allows people to open up their eyes to a new perspective in life and open up their eyes to maybe how to make a negative situation more positive and become more optimistic. I love that. I love that. I think there's a simplicity to, you know, that concept of changing the world. It's showing up each day. And and in my perception and observation, it's something that when I ran across, and I don't even know how I ran across you guys' accounts, but it popped up and I clicked it (laughs) and I read it. And I had very much that same feeling of like, wow, holy crap, like, wow. And it's just amazing. And, And it, and like you said, you're not doing anything special. You're, you're making it through another day and trying to shed some light on a little bit of a moment that might have felt dark or hard or heavy and, and just making it through it and telling people what's real. And that process of sharing the realness in life is inspiring the people. I think there's something special about it. There was probably 10, 15 episodes ago, uh, we had someone on who said, you know, he believes the world needs more transparency. 
And, and the way he described it, he says, if you don't have any things you've done wrong, if you don't have any things you've done that are really stupid when you look back or, or where you screwed up or messed up, he's like, honestly, I don't know how I could relate to you as a human because uh, I, I've pretty much done anything I could imagine and totally royally screwed it up at some point. And he says, I, I think that's what makes us human. And we, when we have the ability to, to become transparent about it and be real, all of a sudden other humans realize they're not alone. And, and it's part of life. And, and now he's like, if you keep doing it, you, now you're just being a turd. But if you learn from it and you evolve, like that, that's literally life. And I, I think it's so special because you're in that process without recognizing it or, or spotlighting it or anything like that. It's just you're naturally just doing life every day and you're doing it in, in such a ferocious way that I, I believe you are that hype man for so many, which is rad. That's extremely sweet. And, and, and very nice of you to say. I mean, it's like you say, we we really do just wake up and get through another day. And it is tough. And I think that it's really, really important to share, you know, the screw ups, the mess ups, the the times of tears and, and not the all the good times. You know, there's a lot of people out there that are just trying to share my life's perfect and there is nothing going wrong with it. But we all have challenges and stuff. And you know, some of them are big, some of them are small, but to that person, it's always big in their life. And uh, some people also tell me, like, if you could get through that, I can get through this tiny thing. And I'm like, you know, it's all relative in life. Some people worry about what they're going to wear today. And I'm worrying about not going into organ rejection again, you know, so it really is relative to people's life and being authentic and being transparent is extremely important in my eyes. Absolutely. Now, here's a question. Speaking of transparency and looking into who you are and learning more about you, we'd love to know, what's your wow factor? What makes you uniquely you? And what's one or two life moments that helped shape that over the years? What makes me me is really my family and my friends. Mm -hmm. I think that they are the people sometimes, you know, that I go to for advice. I talk to every day. I call um in the best moments and the worst moments and really then telling me, keep going, you can do this. And that makes me me because their encouragement really builds me. And in the times where I felt like, Oh my God, I'm, I can't do this. You know, I, after a transplant, you have, I think I had like six chest tubes. I had had already one transplant where I had a sternotomy, which is they cut through your sternum and break your chest open. I broke a bunch of ribs too, because I'm extremely small. The second transplant, I had to do a cut underneath my breast. That's a clamshell cut. And they raise your, your ribs and do the same thing. And it's extremely painful. And I was in, you know, I was going into kidney failure. I was really close to dialysis. So I could not have very much pain medicine. And to get up and walk every single day, it was tough. And I had those people telling me, you know, Brian, my husband and my brother and my parents and my sister, they were all, all there. You can walk a little bit further. You can do it. You can do it. And, and, um, and that's, that's really special. And I had a humbling moment, you know, through all of this, it's been five years since I was listed for my first transplant and the humbling moment really Throughout those five years, I didn't have one moment I thought I was going to die. I was on life support many times. I had a lot of issues, but for most of them, I can't even remember. My brain blocked it out. I was too sick, whatever. This time I was recovering from my transplant. I was doing really, really great. All of a sudden, I just started having these like convulsions, like almost like seizures. We really didn't know why. And my mom and my husband were in the room and um, that day was just really difficult for me. I felt like I was off and we took a walk around, a lap around the, um, the floor of a hospital. We get back to my room and I'm like, you know what? I just want to sit by myself. I want to have some like moment of just me. Like I'm, I'm frustrated. I'm, I'm having a rough time and no one's helping me. I just felt like nobody was helping me. And um, so I'm sitting in the chair and all of a sudden, I'm just like, something's going to happen. Something's going to happen. I started having the convulsions. I went into respiratory failure. No idea why. I mean, we still don't know. There were so many different things that could have been happening. And um, my mom, I, I, she runs into the hallway asking for a doctor. There's like eight doctors that fly in right away. 
And um, one of them just happened to be right outside the door, catches me from falling onto the ground, puts me onto the bed. And they're just, you know, checking me, doing everything. And it's the first time I ever saw my husband back into the corner and start crying. He was legitimately scared. And I've never seen him cry in a hospital setting. He's always strong. And, you know, them being strong for me and me being strong for them when they're scared is so important. But just seeing my mom yelling to the doctor, do whatever you can to save her, anything possible. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm going to die. This is the first time I really thought I was going to die. And they're, you know, the doctors are doing everything. They're pushing my husband and my mom out of the room and they've, they've run me to the ICU and I cannot breathe. I cannot do anything. And they're like, okay, we're going to intubate you. Sign the paper. And everyone's like to me, whatever. And the humbling moment was just sitting there and, and reflecting and being like, I need, I need to be strong. I turn to them and I'm like, mom, whatever happens, don't let Brian go nomad style and just fall off the earth and not talk to anybody. Like he's, you're our family. You're all family, like stay together. And I turned to my husband and I'm like, you know, whatever happens, we always have what we have, hmm. but it's okay for you to fall in love again. And it's okay for you to have a family and it's okay for you to experience life without me because it's important. And I just, had all these thoughts in my head of him with somebody else having kids all of that and I was okay with it and I don't know it was just humbling to imagine the world I guess with my family and everybody without me and accept it hmm. it was strange hmm. there's there, there's a humbleness to that um where you can like you said, you can see the world without you, but somehow come to that point to be able to accept it. I, I, I mm -hmm. think what's what's beautiful about what you guys are doing and the projects you're working on, at least from what I've observed in a short period of time, um, I don't know if the world will ever be without you. There's, there's a ripple you've created that's going into people's lives. And I, I think that legacy will will continue. I think there's there's a, a small ripple that's been created and it's moving and it's it's working throughout the world. Um, but but what a humbling place to get to to be able to accept that and get to that place and and you know purely out of care and love for the people you love the most, be able to give them that freedom from that place. Um, I, I I think I don't want to assume anything, but I'm going to ask with that's gotta that's gotta be the deepest humbling moment we've had so far on the show um <laughs> if, if we tilt it a little what about an awe-inspiring moment yeah so you know going into transplant you kind of have this um almost like a false perception i guess i would say i mean don't get me wrong i think that organ transplant is incredible i mean just to have people around the world who are willing to be donors and actually save a life and have families that are mourning at a time of, you know, the worst moment in their life and they decide to save somebody else. I mean, it is, I, I don't, I don't, I can't really even think of something that is so much more special, you know? Um, but the awe inspiring moment for me was, I went into transplant. I was 23 when I was first listed for my first transplant. And I kept hearing all these people say, you know, all these mentors of mine being like, there's this moment where you take a deep breath and you can just breathe again. And you wake up and you just, you can just fill your lungs up. And it's something that, you know, you, you're going to experience and it's going to be a crazy, incredible feeling. And so I went into my first transplant and I was like, I cannot wait to breathe again. I can't wait to do sports. I can't wait to get in the water. Like growing up, I was so competitive in sports. And so I really wanted to get back to that place. And I go through my first transplant, I wake up and I, I literally am like hyperventilating for the first four months of my transplant. After my first transplant, um, I could not take a deep breath. I could not fill my lungs. It was just terrible. And I was just in, you know, on the couch, just, what is happening? And I had so much anxiety from it because I did not understand. And the way the doctors explained it to me was like, your lung function was so low pre-transplant that all of your muscles in your, 
and your diaphragm and everything just deteriorated because you weren't breathing in so many parts of your lungs. You weren't getting oxygen that they weren't even moving. So you just lost those muscles. And I was like, oh, my gosh. They're like, you know, you got to just build them up again and, and expand your lungs and you'll get there. And, um, you know, I, I got to a healthy place. We went to Hawaii. I had some challenges. And then I went into rejection a year and a half later. And I go through my second transplant. And I wake up this time and I, I can, my memory is just my eyes still shut and everyone around me like, Kayla, how are you doing? Kayla, do, do you remember your name? Where are you? Where are you? What's happening to you? You know, they always, after you get off like life support, they're always like, where are you? What, what day is it? What year is it? Who's the president? Like try to make sure you're, you're, you're there. And I took a deep breath and I had never felt like I, I felt like literally like crying right now. It was such an incredible moment. The entire entirety of my lungs, I felt expand and my rib gauge moved. <laughs> I don't know for like the first time in, in years, it actually moved my chest and elevated and you could see it lift up. And I just, I was like, oh my gosh, you know, my first transplant was just a bridge to get here because these lungs were meant for me. Mm. And this is the most incredible feeling and I'm going to live and I'm actually alive. And mm. it was, I, I just remember like all of this and that feeling will never leave me. It won't. Mm. I talked about it for days to everybody. But I couldn't stop thinking about it. Brian said it's a moment when he saw the biggest smile on your face that he's ever seen in his whole life. <laughs> yeah, he tells me that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm sorry, that was it wasn't that big when I met you, when I married you. <laughs> he said, I'm like, I don't know what's the best moments in my life, my transplant or getting married. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> he said you were scrambling to rearrange the letters and they were saying, slow down, slow down, we can't figure it out. And it, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they finally came together and said, "I can breathe." <laughs> what a moment! Yeah. I can imagine how awe-inspiring that would be. What a beautiful moment! Now, from awe-inspiring yes. and from humbleness, we'll shift gears slightly. What's your greatest fear? That's another easy question for me, and I, you know, I don't have a lot of fears to be honest and when I think about my greatest fear which is often asked um the one thing that comes to mind is just what happens after I die mm -hmm. you know I'm not afraid of death at all it doesn't scare me I've thought I was going to die many times and or you know like thought I I was dying for so many years and before this last transplant, there was months that I would sit in bed and be scared. And Brian would stay up all night watching. He said he would watch my chest breathe because he was so afraid that I would stop breathing. I hear that from new parents all the time. Um, but my greatest fear is just what happens to my family? You know, what happens to Brian? What happens to my mom? These people that I spend every day with I talk about every single thing with I you know we're so my family is so intertwined in each other's lives it's unreal and people say that to us all the time we do everything together we love doing everything together we're all our best friends and I just you know I know people will move on because I see in the community unfortunately there's so much death around me in the cystic fibrosis and transplant community but Eventually, the families move on, and I, you know, I want my family to do that, definitely, but how about that in-between? That's what scares me. I, I don't want, you know, Brian moved to Los Angeles with me because we needed this transplant, and now we're here, and I have a lot of support here. He has a couple of friends here, but what happens? Does he just, we have this lease now in this apartment. What does he continue to live in this apartment that, you know, he, we got together just in order for me to survive. And then we're starting to, to try to get this new life going and we're happy, but 
does he pack up and, and leave and just travel and not talk to anybody and just go into his own head? What happens to my mom? I mean, <laughs> that's the scariest thing. Is I don't know if she'll be able to continue, not because I'm so amazing. That's not it. It's, I really, I don't, I don't, I don't feel like everyone's life, you know, is only going to go on if I'm there. No way, but it's challenging. And I think it scares me because I don't know what I would do if any of them ever passed away. I really don't know. Mm. It would be so hard. Mm. I think there's something special around this. I had a friend, um, for whatever it's worth, I had a friend who totally different scenario she was hiking in nepal and when it 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 helped me in my life with with death and and what moves on and and in this fear in this space um she was hiking in nepal and when she was done she was coming back and she was talking to the the sherpa guy who was helping her with her bag and she just started crying on the way back down the mountain and he looked at her and he said hey what are you crying about and uh she says you know i'm gonna miss this place i don't uh, She's like, I'm going to miss you and I'm going to miss the views and I'm going to miss the how it feels and I'm going to miss the sights and the people and the experiences and the moments. And she just had this list of everything she felt she was going to miss. And he started laughing. And <laughs> she was like, well, that's rude. <laughs> like, Why are you laughing at me? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and and he, he says, oh, honey, life is like the mist. He says, once once you pass through it, it soaks in the part of your being and it'll always be with you no matter where you go. And and I think he said, in life and in death and everywhere you go, life will always be part of you. And I was like, oh. Wow. And it was interesting. I, I remember that experience. And, and so many years later, my one of my grandmothers passed away early, 62. She young. And I remember there was sadness. Um, but there that one line kept hitting me again and again and again which was life is like the mist. She's part of who I am and she will always be here. And it, it was just a weird, it was a weird experience that brought great freedom to that moment because all of a sudden I could close my eyes at any moment and realize she was always there. I could talk with her. I could see her. I could feel her. Um, and, and she was there not in physical form, but just in, in the fabric of my DNA of just being like she was a piece of mist that soaked into my soul and became part of me and therefore will, will always be there. And it was interesting. That's really beautiful. Yeah, it transformed my whole experience with that. Um, but I can definitely see how that is a fear. <laughs> and it's valid. And it's certainly something that exists very real day to day in in, mm-hmm. in your world. Now, this will be an interesting shift from deep fears to what are you most excited about? Nothing. <laughs> the whole future the fact that I have a future I guess uh you know when I was struggling there was always Brian sitting there do it for (laughs) oh my gosh such an overshare do it for Kamiko do it for Kamiko and you're all thinking who is Kamiko well that's the name we have for our daughter in the future um (laughs) yeah so uh, because of transplant and everything, like I can't have children. And so we really, we really want to adopt children in the future. And for me, it's like, I want to be able to be healthy for like three to five years. I want to know that I'll be to be there in that child's life for a long time and that I can support Brian and being a parent and be there. And, um, so we have we have little names for Kamiko for the daughter and Hiroshi for the son, like a, a hero. And um, so he just keeps going, do it for Kamiko, do it for Kamiko. And that just like pushed me and pushed me, you know, like do it because we have a future with the family and we want that future with the family. And and so the fact that now I'm breathing again, I'm, I'm walking and I'm starting to exercise, I'm excited about building muscle exercising, having a future with my family, watching my family go through their special moments and supporting my friends and being there for my friends now. And, and something I'm really important about is really what I said in the beginning of this conversation, which is it takes a village to build a village of success. And, um, you know, my, my foundation fight to breathe. I do a lot of blogging on social media and whatnot, sharing my story, 
But what we also do is we turned it into a foundation to help other people. And right now that is what I'm most passionate about is really diving into it. And, and we have a lot of projects going on. We have mentorship prob- projects, which is basically like a little sister, little brother program, big brother, little brother program, I guess I should say. And it's people with disease who have the same disease that can kind of help each other. And I'm not sure if it's really mentor mentee, but it's more of a balance of what can they give that person? What can this person give them and, and match these people and, and give them support because support in your disease with somebody who's actually gone through those moments is, is really important. And it's, it helps you feel like you're not alone in the world, which so many people feel like that every day. And I, I want to support people, whether that's financially, mentally, you know, just making them be a little bit more happy and making people have less suffering and less, less pain. And um, we do sell apparel. I do a lot of art. We design our own stuff. And um, right now we're doing, we're going to start doing a tease for a cause. And every month we put out this, t-shirt that's going to benefit another organization and the first one is going to be to donate life america and we're really excited to partner with them for that and you know i i just i have all these thoughts all these um emotional connections to what i'm trying to do and um and it's just exciting i guess one more one more thing is when i was in the hospital my my family asked everybody to send in letters and we filled my entire room. I was living in the hospital for five months before my transplant and uh, we filled my entire room with postcards and letters from people. And I would, they would read them to me out loud and it would really motivate me to keep going and, and help me feel like there's so many supporters out there. And uh, we want to do a featured fighter. So somebody who's, who's struggling, who needs some love, some kindness, some motivation, some inspiration who will be grateful for all of this mail coming in and all this uh, colorful words and and that feature fighter we want to do the letter campaign for so you know if you talk to a lot of people Jareek so if there's anybody that we can help just let us know because we we just that's all we want to do is help and it's like you said the ripple effect you help one person that person hopefully helps another and it continues throughout the world so that's uh I guess the most exciting thing in my life right now. What beautiful things to be excited about. Um, we'll definitely support you and we'll definitely make sure that we, we help ripple and amplify anything you guys are supporting in this. Uh, it's a beautiful okay. mission, beautiful mission. And one thing I was talking to Brian about when a few episodes ago, your husband, uh, the, the concept of um, when, when you watch people go through such a hard time and go through moments that are challenging and, uh, there's really a choice. There's a choice to become bitter and close off and shut down and get frustrated, or there, there's a choice to to open and serve and help and find find light in it. Uh, there, there's a beautiful quote that said, "So often people want to show up and be the sunshine to make someone's world brighter, but sometimes we need to be the moonlight on their darkest moment, and and bring some of that light into the the hardest time they're struggling with." I think you guys are doing this beautifully in what you're doing where you are the sunshine and you bring more love and light and positivity and fun and that hype man spirit into their, their bright days. But I, I think you're also beautifully becoming the moonlight for them in their darkest moments and showing them that people care. Other people are there too. There, there's, you're not alone and, and we've got your back. And there's something really special about that. Because like you said, in those moments when your family was able to read those letters to you and show you that people cared, it brings just that little extra strength inside of you to keep going. When it is hard, when it when it is rough, when it doesn't feel like you have a whole lot left. Yeah. How special. How special. Yeah, I mean, one person's words of encouragement can really turn your day around when you're having a bad day. And I don't think people realize that. It really is. I mean, it takes a village, but also one person doing something kind for one other person is, is, is special. It's true. It's true. Whew. Well, we're going to switch gears to the second part of our show. Now, before we do, though, I'm going to throw a selfless plug right in here for you. Uh, or, or, I don't think it's called selfless. Shameless plug. That's what it's called. Right smack Shameless in the middle plug. for you. Um, if you want to learn more of all that Kayla's up to, you can go to fight2, the number two, breathe.org. Is that correct? 
That's correct. Awesome. Fight to the number two, fight to breathe.org. Uh, or follow her online, connect with Instagram. That's where I crossed paths originally with, with her and her wonderful husband and what they're up to. It's at sign fight, the number two, breathe. Uh, you can find her on Instagram, connect there. You can find her on the website. Again, fight to breathe.org. Uh, join in on this. I, I think it's a gift you can give to so many, whether it's being a part of you know, those letter campaigns, which I have a couple people to, to nominate, hopefully will fit in there. Uh, whether it's, you know, stepping up and, and grabbing some of the swag and apparel, but but find a way to join it. I think this is a beautiful mission and something we can all support and, and, and have fun with. Um, now we're going to switch gears to the second kind of segment of the show. It's called Nuts and Bolts. There's only three questions. And so the first question is, where do you currently focus the majority of your thoughts and time and life each day as of right now? The fun part would be the foundation, but the truthful part is, and uh, the truthful part is really just uh, our every day. We wake up at, every day. I wake up at nine. Have to take my anti-rejection medications, my immunosuppressants, all of my vitamins, all of my cystic fibrosis medicine. So at nine o'clock, it's like medicine time. And then we go through the day. We, we almost have like one appointment a day to, with some specialist. Um, and then I do pulmonary rehab, which is two and a half hours, two days a week. And then every day I have to go on at least a 20 minute walk uh, to exercise my lungs and build my lung function. But, you know, with me, it's never a 20 minute walk. It's like an hour walk and three, three miles later, I'm like home and it's hot in LA. I'm not used to the heat. Um, But really it's just that (laughs) every day, my my life you know waking up the things I have to do getting through the day and if that continues from literally the moment I wake up all the way through the night because I also have diabetes so if my blood sugar is going low or extremely high I have to wake up and I get all these alarms and that's really the majority of my time and thoughts is how do I do better how do I amplify my health how do I ensure that I'm going to be here and be here alive for Kamiko so that's really what it is Uh uh-huh what a beautiful reason to live, too. The little one who's waiting for you in the future. <laughs> not even born yet. Not even uh, <laughs> any. Not even in this universe yet. But hopefully, you know, hopefully that that will be a part of my life and a part of my family's life. That would be a beautiful addition. Now, here's a question. With all of this process you have to go through each day and, and all the mm. steps just to keep healing and keep getting stronger and keep moving forward, what would you say is the key to your success in that whole process? Having self-motivation for sure. Having those things that are going to keep you going. I think one of the things I tell people a lot when they just say, I can't, I cannot continue to keep going. How do you stay positive? How do you stay, you know, every day you just wake up and you're smiling. How is that possible? And I think when you feel like you cannot do anything, you can't succeed in life, it's really important to set small goals. And these goals can be anything. I mean, sometimes it's my goal today is going to be to text a friend and say, hey, just thinking of you. Or my goal is going to be today to shower, which I know sounds crazy to most of the population in the world, but um, when you're when you're sick, it's really hard sometimes to get up and shower, get dressed, and do all those things. Um, and then you know sometimes it's the goals of I don't know climbing one step so the next day you can take two steps. Um, but these small goals allow you to achieve them. You always want to set small achievable goals. And when you achieve one goal, you feel more confident in yourself. You feel more. Um, you know, excited, more just energetic. And that allows you to set the next goal and it's going to grow and the goals are going to get bigger and bigger. And when you gain this, those goals, you feel like you're achieving something and you can, you know, change your own life and you get just so much fire under your ass. I can say that. I don't know if I can say that, but you do get this little spark in yourself that uh, pushes you along and pushes you to be the best you, you can be. And I think that's at least what's been my key to success in all of this that I've gone through. I love it. Self-motivation, setting those small goals that you can have a victory each time 
and, and taking it one step at a time and pushing forward, knowing that if you keep doing it, you will get stronger. How, how beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's so true. So true. Now, we've come to our final question. What is one actionable tip that can help others achieve or experience the kind of success in their life that you've been able to create in yours? I think this is uh, the, the most difficult. Um, open your eyes to the world and, and the people around you and the people in different countries and just see what they're going through because we all have this life and we all have our own life. And even me for my husband, we have, we're living our life, right? And we're trying to achieve our dreams and we're trying to have our family. And it's really important to take the time to look around. What is somebody else doing to make the world better? What is somebody else doing that's hurting them? And kind of taking all of that in, helping how we can, but really just having that help shape you and the person you are is your success, really. It's, you know, your your thoughts, your morals, your actions. Those are what makes us us. And we can only be us because we're influenced by, by others and by the world. Mm, I love that tip. Open your eyes to the world. Notice all the little things, the beauty, the struggles, the challenges, the dreams, the desires, the goals. And, and like you said, allow it to shape you and allow that village, hopefully, to support you and, and to be there. Um, I, I, I love all the things you touched on from the very beginning. I, I love the fact that you mentioned it, it, it does take a village. You know, it takes those friends and family and community, whether they, they're blood family or chosen family, either way, that group of people around you who, who mm -hmm. cheer for you and support you and love you and challenge you. And, and call you out on your worst days and say, hey, come back to the game. Let's go. You've got this. Um, you know, that that really, truly to, to be there for you in your, in your darkest nights and your brightest days. Uh, I like the hype man concept you brought to life. <laughs> I, I think whether you realize it or not, I think you realize that you, you're a hype man for so many. Um, I, I love what you guys are doing with the, the Fight to Breathe uh, Foundation and organization there. Again, if you want to find it on Instagram, it's at fight number two, breathe, fight to breathe, or fight to breathe.org. I, I love the letter campaign, and I, I think there's something really true and apparent throughout this entire conversation. Even though uh, you're faced with your own challenges each day and, and you're constantly fighting to become a stronger and healthier version of yourself in the process, uh, you live in such service of others, and, and you have such a big heart that cares so much about that village around you and the community around you, and not just that, the, the people you don't even know who are going through their own battles and their own struggles. And I, I think just a, an outside of observation and, and you know, a, a small uh, reflection from the outside from me to you is, is you're doing a beautiful job. And in what you're doing, it, it, like I said, it's rippling out in the world and it's affecting so many in a positive way. And it's very, very beautiful and it's inspiring. And, uh, you know, it certainly touched my heart today. And I hope everyone listening, it touched theirs and, and, you know, brought a little bit more love or life to them. I hope they do come and visit you at, you know, at sign fight to breathe on Instagram or www.fighttobreathe.org. And I hope they join in because like you said, those little words of encouragement, those little thoughts, or just knowing that someone cares. Even if you just draw someone a picture and send it to them as a letter, just knowing that someone took the time to send a little bit of love and life to you in those hard moments can, can be that moonlight in, in your darkest moment and bring some light back into your life. So, Thank you so much for, for having me, and thank you to all the listeners. And, um, this has been really, really great, really fun. Well, thank you so much for sharing so much with us. Uh, you definitely brought some tears to my, my eyes and some warmth to my heart. <laughs> so I appreciate you. I appreciate all that you're up to. I appreciate everyone who took time to listen in. Um, you know someone who needs to listen to this episode, please share it with them. Families, friends, always welcome. Uh, we believe sharing is caring, and we like caring people, so make sure to share and uh, we look forward to seeing all of you next episode.